December 2022. Everywhere, work is winding down for the holidays. Everywhere, except of course, the Pascas Studio. After a year of epic and inspiring stories, producer Christina and Gavin are wringing their hands, anxious because the upcoming episode list is looking thinner than Ken Miles after 24 hours of Le Mans. That's when Christina has a brilliant idea. Dear Santa, what I would love more than anything in this world is some banger-ass ideas for our podcast. P.S. Love your zaddy vibe. Let me know when Mrs. Claus is not in the picture. That is inappropriate, Christina. Then, without warning, the Pascas inbox magically starts filling up with emails. Will they be good? Kind of offensive? Typo-ridden? Or has Christina's Christmas wish come true? Today on Pass Gas, we're going to find out. The boys are going to learn a little bit about seven different listener-submitted suggestions. This is episode 167, Santa's Coal Bag. We did your crummy ideas. Pass Gas Podcast. It's about cars. It's not about ports. Big thank you to our sponsor this week, Rocket Money. Stop throwing your money away. Cancel unwanted subscriptions and manage your expenses the easy way by going to rocketmoney.com slash gas. That's rocketmoney.com slash gas. Rocketmoney.com slash gas. Thank you, Rocket Money. Okay, so just to clarify, we get a lot of suggestions for topics uh, on this show and on our YouTube channel, Donut Media. Some of them are good, and we end up doing them. Mm-hmm. Some of them, I yeah. think people kind of miss the point, miss the mark a little bit. Some of them might be from younger audience members that haven't quite figured out their creative potential yet. And some of them, I think, are from dumb people who think <laughs> dumb ideas are some good Some of them ideas. are like, oh, you should do an episode on Keiichi Sushiya. And then some of them are like, you should do an episode on this guy who's got a cool car down the road from me. He's pretty cool. Yeah, can you do an episode on my car? Yeah. yeah. we Look, I appreciate all the ideas that come in. I'm super excited to do this episode. Me too. Santa's coal bag? That sounds fun. And just to clarify, we love any emails that you send us. Yes. Don't. Stop sending us no, emails. because then if you stop sending us emails, we won't do another episode of this, and I just have a feeling this is going to be a fun one. Guys, let's should be very cognizant of how mean we are. Yes. Yeah, because we're mean to each other, but that's out of love. Yeah, yeah. that is out that's of love. That's a little tough hey, love for us. And if we're a little mean to you guys, that's also out of love. We're just yeah, all here for fun, so if I call you a dumb <laughs> I mean... <it. laughs> If you guys were impressed by my use of the word cognizant, make sure you listen to next week's episode. That's a real smart script. Where I realize how dumb I am. <laughs> yes. And we all commit to reading more so we know more words. Yes. <laughs> uh, welcome to Pascast, everybody. I hope you had a great holiday season with your family, no matter what you celebrate. I, I wish the world for you. My name is Nolan Sykes. I'm joined by my co-hosts, James Pumphrey. Ho, ho, ho. Tinkle, tinkle, tinkle. Who's that on the roof? I think it's Nick. <laughs> and, and Joe Weber. Oh, jingle jangle! Here comes Nick. <laughs> look, <laughs> yeah. so don't look now. It's big fat Nick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I'm really, really excited to get into your guys' suggestions this week. Normally, like we'll get a suggestion, and maybe it's like two pages worth of like story. Uh-huh. So this is our compilation of like all those ideas that come together. So we make one big episode out of a bunch of little ideas. Yeah, that's right. the idea like, here. A lot of the ideas there's not just a, there's not enough to fill yes. an yeah. entire hour. So you know, like Nolan said, this is a, a bunch of little Pixar shorts. Ooh. Yeah, this is like a, when we used to we were trying to do this for Wheelhouse a while ago. And yeah. We were like, why do dogs stick their head out the window? Why do VW smell like crayons? They're all like two minute stories. Yeah. So I actually have a, a wheelhouse script about the crayons thing that's yeah. one and a half pages yeah <laughs> i just have it in my google drive it's uh, because it's of waiting. the yeah. stuff it's made out the of glue the, the glue. glue uh yeah specifically the glue is made in this certain factory you know what i want to do an episode on sometime hmm. what language is a dog's internal monologue in <laughs> is it english or it's german wolf. or wherever they're from or is it like inside their head they're like bark 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 yeah bark. i think it's persian all dogs mm. are Persian? Yeah. <laughs> hmm. All right. So without further ado, here's our first story. Okay. This one's from Iceland. So I'm going to do my best. I love the people of Iceland. 
I want to visit Iceland and see the the beautiful volcanoes. Oh yeah. Uh, there's a hot dog place I want to eat there that I've seen on many a food really? show. Yeah. Hmm. Do um, they have crazy like elk hot dogs or something? I don't think so. No. Take that no. beautiful wildlife and grind it up into a hot dog. <laughs> I think it, they're not traditional American toppings, but nothing crazy. Yeah. Fermented fish. Uh, volcanic. I, there's steam. no reindeer in it. Like my from my friend Fat Nick. <laughs> <laughs> this submission is from Orn Ing... Oh, God. I'm doing my best, Orn. I'm doing my best here, buddy. Ingemarsson. Orn Ingemarsson in Iceland. He wrote... I want to tell you about Formula. <laughs> <laughs> I want to tell you about Formula Off Road here in Iceland. Custom made trucks with a thousand plus horsepower, real American V8s, and big shuffle tires. So like paddle tires. Hell yeah! Uh, Shooting themselves up ninety degree hills and even driving on water. Yeah, dude, this stuff is cool. The knockoff Top Gear. That's a quote. Did a show about it, and Freddie Flintoff even raced and got the nickname. Flip off after the race. Hey, nice. No. I would have yeah. called him Freddie Flintstone. Is are we the knockoff Top Gear? Because we never made that video. No, 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 no. Uh, I think actual Top Gear also did a did a segment on these as well. These things are sick. Yeah. yeah. All right. So the big reason we've decided to cover this in this episode is because Formula Off Road is really cool, but a little difficult to get verified research that could fill an entire hour. Uh, the best way to understand it is to watch it. So. Um, Take a pause, watch it on your phone, pull, pull your, your car drive. over, yeah. pull up YouTube. But let's talk about, let's talk about the history that we could find. Formula Off-Road began in Iceland on May 2nd, 1965. Uh, the Right off the bat, this is some pretty specific history that we could find. <laughs> in short, it's a way to do off-road driving in a closed course. Today, rock mines are used because they offer the right kind of terrain but are still close to nearby towns. Mm -hmm. The tracks themselves are marked by old tires, flags, or sticks, but tend to be makeshift. The first competition was hosted by... What? Bifrio Kluber Reykjavik. Oh, mm -hmm. like he's from Reykjavik. Mm-hmm. A.K.A. Bicker Reykjavik. <laughs> <laughs> or BKR. Oh. <laughs> it stands for Reykjavik's Car Club. It was won by Egil Gunnar Ingolfsson. With that competition, Porkel Goodnason and fellow members of BKR decided to officially found the Formula Off-Road Championship. I love that. It's a little tongue-in-cheek. You know, it's like, hey, they knew that Formula One was going on. Uh -huh. We're Formula Off-Road. Yeah. yeah. And also the acronym spells FORK. That's cool. Nice. <laughs> BKR hosted its competition for years, but in 1969, nice. The volunteer rescue team Stalker in Keflavik started hosting a similar competition, and then the volunteer rescue team in Hella did the same. Both teams organized their events as a fundraising event as groups of Icelandic rescue workers would show up with their four-wheel drive cars to mess around on Icelandic hills. In 1979, the first official Icelandic championship was held, and its first champion was Benedict Cumberpatch. <laughs> Benedict Ija Olfsen. Nice. Nice pronunciation. Thanks. Perfect. Flawless, as always. <laughs> really good at names and cities. You've been doing your Duolingo. I've been <laughs> doing my Duolingo with Dua Lipa. <laughs> That's where Dua Lipa teaches you Icelandic words. Very specific product. I wish I wouldn't have invested so much money into it. <laughs> In the beginning of the championship, there was only one class, uh, much like early schools. <laughs> <laughs> but due to some uh, competitors' addition of multi-paddle tires, organizers added a second class in 1985. And thus, the two classes, modified class and unlimited class, were formed. The unlimited class is the major league class that allows 4x4s to use paddle tires, which dig into the earth between hops mm -hmm. and short flights. That's cool. The modified class is pretty much a, like a truck and has a body that must resemble a mass-produced vehicle with a bonnet, or if you're one of our American listeners, that means hood. 
side body panels, and front and rear fenders that must be installed to resemble the original vehicle. Uh, resemble leaves some room yeah, for some interpretation. Yeah. Later, the street legal class was added, probably because of that uh, yeah. room for interpretation. <laughs> uh, the definition is pretty straightforward. These are street legal vehicles that come equipped with lights, license plates, and annual inspection. In fact, during those early years of competition, many competitors would show up in their regular daily drivers, remove equipment that they didn't need, change those tires to multi-paddle, and get going up that big old dang old hill. That's sick. Uh, don't go too far, though. You don't want to fall in the volcano. Don't go into the lava. When you see the lava, stop. <laughs> Formula Off-Road branched out from Iceland in 1990 when the first competition was held in Sabo, Sweden, in, a, in an event... Organized by <laughs> Jeppe Kluber, Reykjavikur, and Veteran Off-Roaders. Nice. Nice. Oh, I get it. Like, Jeppe Kluber is like driving club. Mm -hmm. Jeppe Kluber. That's cool. Yeah. Dude. We I should think start I, a Jeppe Kluber. I think I'm uh, learning Icelandic, Icelandic from yeah. osmo osmosis. Yeah. Then it exploded across Scandinavia with events held in Sweden, Finland, Norway, and Denmark. <laughs> How's that for a pronunciation? That's great. There was a World Cup established uh, and held by Iceland from 1997 to 2008, but it wasn't until 2004 that the Scandies joined in. In 2018, in Akrain's Iceland, American Andrew Blackwood became the first American yeah, to compete in the Icelandic Formula Off-Road. He drove in the Unlimited class. Of course he did. He's American. He probably looks like Kid Rock. In, the, in, <laughs> in a drummer in a car that's well-known to Icelandic competition, uh, the car was owned by Gester J. Ingolfsson. You didn't need to have that guy's name in there. You just want <laughs> As for safety, roll bars used to be the only requirement, but they weren't even the complete roll cages that we see today. Today, drivers are required to use a full cage, a full-face helmet with a Hans device, five-point harnesses, uh, and homologated bucket seats, flame-resistant clothing, so coveralls, shoes, gloves, probably a little hood face thing, mm -hmm. arm restraints, arm restraints. Wow. Yeah, what does that mean? Well, okay, so this is also common in drag racing as well. Like, there are these belts for your arms that clip in, also clip into your, your harness system, See, so your arms don't fly out yeah, when you yeah. roll over. Yeah, yeah. I just want a car where your arms don't fly off when you drive it. <laughs> <laughs> It's impressive to note that despite the inherent dangerousness of the sport in 50 years of Formula Off-Road racing, there has not been a serious driver injury that can be traced back to the cars themselves. That's, uh, That's a what? spurious way of... Uh, yeah. <laughs> Lots of stabbings. Yeah. But yeah. Good, good on them. Our next email was suggested by listener Nishan. Thank you, Nishan. Uh, quote, here's from their uh, email. Osho was the leader of the Rajneesh movement of the 1980s. He was obsessed with Rolls Royce, and people would watch his convoy drive by every day. The documentary Wild Wild Country on mm. Netflix is a good oh. overview of the subject. Yeah, you guys remember the Rajneeshes. Yes. Wild Wild Country is a wild, wild documentary series. <laughs> yes. Even though there's tons of info about there about Osho and his Rajneesh movement, aside from his affinity for Rolls Royces, it's not quite past gassy enough. Not enough cars. Okay, but if your interest is peaked, definitely check out that mini series. Uh, it'll make you reconsider whether or not you can pull off an all orange outfit. I can. <laughs> I believe it. Uh, <laughs> the Netherlands World Cup team would like a word. <laughs> Osho was born Chandra Mohan Jain, the eldest son of a cloth merchant. He grew up alongside 11 siblings in a small village in India and was often described as a gifted yet rebellious student. He was interested in communism, and when he found that to be, quote, dead, he was uh, deeply critical of traditional religion. Instead, Rajneesh, as he came to be called, was intrigued by the occult, breath control, yoga, meditation, fasting, and hypnosis. After reaching enlightenment by 21... That's when I reached enlightenment. Uh, he rejected... That's when you booked enlightenment? Yeah, that's when I booked enlightenment. <laughs> He rejected his family's request that he marry, and after several years at university, he became a popular philosophy lecturer at Jabalpur University by age 27. Rajneesh soon began traveling throughout India under the pseudonym Akarya Rajneesh 
and gave lectures critical of socialism, Gandhi, and organized religion. We're going to jump ahead a bit for the sake of the story. By 1974, Rajneesh set up his first commune, Pune Ashram, in Pune, India. The ashram has been described as exciting, intense, emotionally charged, and spoiler alert, you can still visit a version of it today. But it's called the Osho International Meditation Resort. My uh, grandma lived in India for years. Really? Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Cool. By 1981. She's mean. Oh. By 1981, the ashram hosted a whopping 30,000 visitors each year. But despite this popularity, Rajneesh decided to move on. Rajneesh flew to the U.S. to have back surgery. But later that year, he purchased the Big Muddy Ranch, which was 120 miles east of Portland, Oregon, near a super tiny town called Antelope. Do you think it was really a Big Muddy Ranch, or was, was it like a Greenland, Iceland type of thing? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. No one come here. No it's one come big here. and muddy. This is a big old muddy ranch. Yeah. The ranch covered 64,000 acres and eventually became home to 4,000 orangish red clad followers, though that number grew to nearly 15,000 during summer festivals. It was there at the newly renamed Rancho Rajneesh that the guru preached his teaching of free sex and materialism, which is where we get into the cars, okay? Time out. Yeah. This dude was just all about like, doing it and driving cool cars yeah (laughs) it's kind of like us (laughs) Uh, (laughs) despite his outward appearance Rajneesh wasn't like the other gurus in one major way he loved worldly possessions and proudly lived in luxury yeah as he explained in a 1982 interview with an INS officer who asked him about the importance of wealth he said quote all the religions have commanded and praised poverty and I condemned all those religions. Hell yeah. Because of their praise of poverty, poverty has persisted in the world. I don't condemn wealth. Wealth is a perfect means which can enhance people in every way. So I am a materialist spiritualist. I kind of agree with that yeah. because, you know, like the Vatican is so rich. Yeah. They preach that, you know, tithing, giving yeah, yeah. 10% mm-hmm. of your income. Yeah. Why keep people down if they, like, can't afford it? Yeah, you I, should be poor, but I'm going to live in this <laughs> castle yeah. over here. I'm going to have gold uh, yeah, slippers. Yeah, or, like, the Joel Olsteins of the world. I certainly yeah. agree with those points, but I don't think that the praise of poverty has uh, persisted. Had, has, is I the think only it does. Ca- no, that's it's not, not the only cause, no, but I do but, like, think that's it what he's saying. He's saying. Sure. I think his view is it's a little... It's a trick. He, he, he has a obviously commune this now. Guy, he's, obviously a commune. This guy he's got robbed. his commune, and he's very outward with yeah. the fact that he's like, dude, I got all this money that people are giving me. I'm going to have a gold couch. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm just Rolls saying Royces. it's kind of a... What we're gonna get. If he's I was better at talking, I would be a con man in one second. <laughs> <laughs> but because I'm not, I can speak against it. Yeah, There's anyway. a lot of hypocrisy in religion regarding... And he's just being very outward whatever, with it. And he's just like, yeah, he's I'm owning it. Yeah. Which, having been very poor and now extremely wealthy, yeah. I definitely can like sure. being rich better. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. It didn't quite matter that his followers worked 12-hour days to feed his dream of a utopian community and his love for jewels and expensive cars, especially Rolls Royces. His first two Rolls Royces were a Corniche and a Silver Shadow, which were shipped from the Poon Ashram to the Oregon Ranch. He had a Rolls in India? Yeah. And every day, his disciples were treated to his daily drive-by, where the guru drove one of his 93 Rolls Royces. (laughs) 93 Rolls Royces? He had 93 Rolls, okay? That's That's 92 too many. That's a lot, yeah. (laughs) Many of them were painted. I can see having two. Yeah. (laughs) Many of them were painted in psychedelic colors, with some decorated with peacocks and lacy curtains. Oh, the peacock one is sick. (laughs) That's a... Somebody who loves network television but doesn't, <laughs> doesn't know the name. The, <laughs> horn, the horn goes bang, bang, bang. That's funny. Dude, the peacock one is hard. And the spectrum one. Whoa. The peacock one is sick. The rest you of them are kind of ca- weak, in com- my uh, opinion. Cable companies and networks. <laughs> <laughs> like, I love spectrum. I love NBC. The one with clouds is kind of whack. The peacock one is sick though. That is that is tight. Yeah, I like. That. I kind of want to get into peacock. Or, you know, have more peacocks. Whoa, the spectrum on one is sick. Yeah, I'm on the spectrum. <laughs> okay. <laughs> However, it wasn't all for show. There was a practical reason behind Rajneesh's Rolls Royce obsession, as the Oregonian reported. Quote: 
The ownership of the cars was transferred from the Rashnish Foundation International to the tax-exempt Rashnish Modern Car Collection Trust in 1982. Stop. The trust served as a tax-exempt conduit for donations from wealthy Saniasins who, quote, leased the cars for as much as $6,000 a month, semicolon, in 1982 alone, comma, $498,784 flowed into the Rajneesh Investment Corporation through this convenient conduit. Ah. Full stop. Regardless, the fun eventually came to an end, which we're not going to get into here. But basically, there are some alleged attempted poisonings by his gun-toting personal secretary, a whole bunch of angry Oregonians, and a perspective change on the whole free sex thing due to the AIDS epidemic. Rajneesh was eventually arrested for immigration fraud and deported from the United States. Several countries refused to let him enter, and he eventually returned to India in 1985, where he denounced the U.S. as a monster that should be hushed up forever. Hush up that monster. Yeah, hush that monster. Shh. Shh. <laughs> Give me my Rolls back. And as for those Rolls Royces, nearly all of them were sold, many to a car dealer in Texas. And yes... Most of them God were repainted. It. No! That's the only good thing that came out of this whole yeah. debacle. I do kind of want a peacock on my car now. So, yeah. <laughs> An Audi A3 with a peacock on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Weird little story there. Uh, definitely check out Wild Wild Country if you're one of the few people that haven't seen it yet. Yeah. It was super popular when it came out. But, uh, yeah. 93 Rolls Royces in a convenient tax evasion scheme. 93 Rolls Royces is like just a problem. That's a lot. Yeah. yeah. Like how do you maintain the maintenance on that? Must the maintenance cost is so crazy. Much. I know. I don't want 93 anything. 93 Dollars. to infinity. Yeah. yeah. Hand me 93 bucks right now. I'll be happy about I that. Hey, man, I don't have it. Yeah. Give me that money. I don't have it, man. I'm sorry, <laughs> Nolan. I have about 93 Matchbox cars, and they're taking up a lot of space in my house. That's a lot. Yeah, I, yeah, I got rid of a lot of Matchbox cars. <laughs> Have you guys ever seen ten dollars cash before? No, well, I got ninety seven. I got ninety three <laughs> problems, but a bitch ain't one. Hit me with the next story. <laughs> <laughs> Big thank you to our sponsor this week, Rocket Money. Say goodbye to last year's outdated, disorganized methods of managing your money and say hello to Rocket Money, the better way to hack your finances in 2023. Rocket Money, formerly known as Truebill, is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps you lower your bills all in one place. Over 80% of people have subscriptions they forgot about, like that streaming service you bought just to watch that one show on, or that free trial that you never even used. Man, how many times have I been bitten by that old trick? Rocket Money makes canceling subscriptions as easy as the click of a button. Simply find the subscription you don't want and press cancel, and Rocket Money will cancel it for you. No long hold times with customer service or tedious emailing back and forth. Man, this sounds great. I'm going to download Rocket Money right after I record this spot right here. Stop throwing your money away. Cancel unwanted subscriptions and manage your expenses the easy way by going to rocketmoney.com slash gas. That's rocketmoney.com slash gas. Rocketmoney.com slash gas. Thank you, Rocket Money. Uh, this next suggestion is from my guy, Morty. Uh, who is my friend, lives in New Mexico. Oh, this fan mail, if read aloud, should be read by whomever can hold the best posh British accent. I like British cars. And that was stipulated by Morty. Yeah, Morty said that. Okay, well. To the hosts of Past Gas Podcast. Hello, it is I, Morty, three-star general in the Wink Wink Army, Whoa. boost creepiest. Uh, don't, I don't think you should say boost creepiest. <laughs> Don't announce yourself as that. I'll give him notes. <laughs> <laughs> and Donut Underground Vato. Hey, now. Joe, that's not a British accent. Yeah. Oh, I'm supposed to read this part in a British to accent? The hosts of okay. the, to the host of the... You, you had your chance. Okay, go Morty's for it. Morty's my homie, too, now. Oh, okay, go for What's it. What's up, Morty? To the hosts of the Past Gas Podcast. Hello. This is I, Morty. Three-star general in the Wink Wink Army, boost creepiest and donut underground Votto. <laughs> I've waited to write you this letter as my thoughts surrounding the world of cars is ever-changing and long-winded. Do I write in to ask for a specific topic or idea? Do I sell them my new show ideas? 
Dare I request counsel with those at the center of donuts? <laughs> at the hole? <laughs> what, Morty? <laughs> at the, the hole of, of a donut. donut. <laughs> I dare not. I've been listening to past guests since the days of old and watching donuts videos since before I could walk. I'm 27 years <laughs> old. I am on the spectrum of autism. And like many people, I struggle to find what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. I was a kitchen designer out of uni who has only ever thought about cars and driving. I had to make a change. You can't drive a car in a kitchen. <laughs> I had to represent the demographic of car culture I want to see in the world. Dude, M Morty rocks. Dude. Yeah, Morty's yeah, cool, dude, his dude. voice is sick. Yeah. <laughs> Here's how you can participate today, gentlemen. Help me pick my actual license plate. I drive an R56 Mini Cooper S in British Racing Green Metallic. My front runners are small, okay. S-M-O-L, like O, that's small. <laughs> gone, G-O-N, like O, he gone. Randy, it's like British for horny. <laughs> <laughs> or in it i-n-n-i-t like this t is rubbish in it in it feel free to add your own i'm sure i'm missing some real winners thanks again to the past gases and all you pastry people at donut keep it juice gentlemen sincerely Morty. Uh, Morty yeah. rules. Morty rules. What do you think for this license plate? I like small. Small? Small's, yeah. Yeah. small's good. Because uh, like Randy, I, I, I like that it's British for horny, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. But like people will be like, hey, Randy. And he'll be like, my name is Morty. <laughs> you know? But also like if you were over here in the U.S. and you saw a license plate that said horny on it, <laughs> you'd be like, uh, <laughs> like that gonna, guy's cool. I'm going yeah. to avoid that guy. I mean, I think horny would be a great license plate. Horny would be a sick <laughs> license yeah. plate. I kind of like gone because he gone is like what, uh, what Hawk Harrelson used to announce for the white Sox. Mm. He's mm. like, Oh, when I, he hits a home run, he goes, Oh, he gone. Uh, yeah, but then we're going for more of a British theme than a yeah. Chicago theme. <laughs> yeah. uh, Wicket, then. I like, I, I like I, In It. I do like In It in a it, lot. It's pretty yeah. good. Yeah. yeah. But also could be confused for In It, mm. as in In It to Win It. Yeah. I don't know if that's something you want to consider. My vote goes to small. All right. I so like well. that. Let's yeah. also, I'm, I'm going to say small as well. well close second, In It. Yeah. I also vote for small. All yeah. right. Well, Gone's thank you. Gone's good. Randy. Uh, is I too think horny. Be confusing. Too horny. But if you want to just do horny, I support that. Horny <laughs> if they'll let you. Okay. <laughs> uh, thank That's you very much. That's a good way to live, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> horny <laughs> if they'll let you. Thank yeah. Thank you very much for your email, Morty. Uh, that was very fun. Uh, our next email suggestion comes from Andrew. Quote, I'm an industrial designer, and I find it surprising how few people really know what it is and how important it is for the automotive industry. Raymond Lowy is a well-renowned industrial designer and designed a few iconic cars. I think an episode about him would be interesting and also informative to a lot of people who are unfamiliar with industrial design. Hmm. For those of our listeners who aren't familiar with the concept of industrial design, it's pretty much what you might assume it is. It's the process of applying design principles like ergonomics, form, and function to physical products with the goal of making intuitive products that improve the lives of its users. Also, they should be beautiful. Raymond Lowy was born in France on November 5th, 1893, though he spent most of his professional career in the United States after moving to America in 1919. He's responsible for designing the Shell, Exxon, TWA, BP, U.S. Mail, and many other logos, as well as toasters and tea kettles, and Coca-Cola vending machines and bottles, the Lucky Strike package, Whoa. the redesign of Sears' best-selling Cold Spot refrigerator. He did the Air Force One livery. He, made, he designed farm harvesters, railroad designs, like the color scheme and eagle motif for the Missouri Pacific Railroad. The NASA Skylab that wow. predates the International Whoa. Space Station. You and know, fun fact about me, I own Skylab. Wow. <laughs> Isn't it like in the ocean now? Mm -hmm, but it's mine. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and for the purposes of our podcast, 
This man is also responsible for the Studebaker, Avanti, and Champion models. This list doesn't even contain everything he made. The Frenchman pretty much invented the look and feel of Americana, even though he was French. Whoa. It's funny because also they gave us the Statue of Liberty, which is a that is cool. symbol yeah. of our Great country. Ally. Yeah, it is cool. Yeah. And they invented spaghetti. A lot of people think it's the Italians. I thought it was the Italians up until just now. At the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, that's like there's an industrial design like air exhibit, like yeah. area. But uh, it has like a bunch of products that are like revolutionary or whatever. Like yeah. it has like a Bic lighter. Uh huh, and uh, a bunch of cool stuff like that. And I think he, I you went you went into a bodega. No, it was like uh, I got a, uh, went to the gift shop. I got a honey bun, <laughs> the Aki way. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're gonna take this uh, chopped cheese and we're gonna put yeah, it on a honey a chop, bun. I got a chopped cheese on a pop tart, the Aki way. <laughs> I'm talking about the Metropolitan Museum of Art. <laughs> I know where I was. <laughs> From 1936 <laughs> until the early 60s, Lowy worked with Studebaker after company president Paul Hoffman, a fan of the designer's work, gave him, quote, pretty much carte blanche. And he understood that because he was French. French. That's right. To do whatever he wanted. Carte blanche is French for blank slate. Ah. Though he worked alongside a team of talented designers, Lowy insisted on taking full credit for his firm's designs, something the designers obviously took issue with. In any case, Lowe is behind many iconic designs, including a new futuristic logo that began appearing on the cars in the 1930s. During World War II, when the U.S. government put restrictions on the Big Three's design departments, Lowe's firm was able to continue working with Studebaker, the fourth largest car manufacturer at the time, since they were a contractor, not an in-house team. Little loophole there. This allowed Studebaker to launch the first brand new post-war car in 1947. The company hammered this point home with the tagline, first by far with a post-war car. Lowy's team, led by Virgil Exner, created a futuristic design featuring flush front fenders and clean rearward lines. They also created the Starlight Body, which features a rear window system that wrapped 180 degrees around the rear seat. That's pretty cool. This was a revelation in the industry, a radical departure from prior models that tended to shroud the rear passenger seats don't you have a big curved piece of glass on your car a little bit yeah it actually the glass the front and rear windshield always gives me when i see people guys throwing stuff outside yeah i always get worried because if my windshield or stuff gets broken i get worried too there's like no that way to replace that stuff yeah yeah i get worried when people throw stuff outside just because like i don't want any damage to happen yeah. to my car yeah, yeah. yeah. anyway Oh, what is that? That yeah. is that is strange. So it's not one piece of glass; it's four pieces of glass in like a very curved. Yeah, uh, that is that is something to behold. If that I is wasn't wild. paying attention, I was driving behind this car. I would flip out and be like, "Oh, are they driving yeah, right at me backwards?" And this was around the time the iconic bullet nose Studebakers were released. And in 1953, the Starliner and Starlight Coupes debuted. Though they were credited to Lowy. They were actually designed by Robert Burke on his team. The Starlight is one of motor journalists' best described cars of the 50s, as evidenced by its inclusion on lists compiled by outlets like Collectible Automobile, Car and Driver, and Motor Trend. However, the Starlight was often plagued by production problems. Lowy's final commission in the 1950s for Studebaker was a transformation of the Starlight and Starliner Coupes into the 56 model year Hawk series, which came in Silver Hawk, Skyhawk, Packard Hawk, Whoa. and of course a Golden Hawk. This Studebaker looks like uh like Aston Martin DB5 or something. It's crazy. Which of course, Joe, uh the Golden Hawk featured a supercharged President 289 cubic inch oh my V8. God. President? President. That's a cool name for an engine. However, Lowy's masterpiece was his 1962-1963 Studebaker Avanti. Studebaker had enlisted the designer to help craft a car that would attract young buyers. Despite a 40-day schedule to produce a finished design and scaled model, Lowy was in 40 days to design a car. He put together a team and leased a house in Palm Springs to work on the design. Oh, dude, I w wish I was there. Yeah. yeah. You know those dudes were just drinking whiskey and chief and cigs. Yeah, so. yeah. The Avanti ah, is characterized. We got a car. <laughs> The Avanti is characterized by elegant and clean lines and an original front with a grillless nose. Uh, this thing 
is interesting. It looks like it was designed in 40 days. <laughs> it does. It, yeah, it's like almost really sick. Yeah. yeah. Lowy described his design ethos by saying that, quote, the We had to do it in 40 yeah. days. <laughs> the adult public's taste is not necessarily ready to accept the logical solutions to their requirements if the solution implies too vast a departure from what they have been conditioned into accepting as the norm. That really sounds most, like Morpheus from The Matrix. I know. That was the yeah. most long, long-winded way of saying, yeah, it looks a little weird. <laughs> I know. <laughs> he often summarizes kids views. are going to love it. <laughs> yeah. He often summarized his views with the acronym MAYA, which stood for Most Advanced Yet Acceptable. I think Jay Leno has one of these things. Oh, yeah, for uh, sure. I, I know I've heard the name a million times, yeah, but seen it, I'm like... Yeah, he's like really famous. He had a talk show yeah. forever. Yeah. He's not a big I don't know. Guy. The Avanti, I'm not... <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't know if I'm feeling this one, man. No, it know. does look like a drawing. I do really like the hawk, though. The, the 56 hawk. Is hawk. Really cool looking. I was like, maybe I should start looking for one of these, and then I was like, don't do that, you stupid idiot. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I needed like. A, a, we did the Civic shoot this week, and I have been looking at CRXs all week. Oh yeah, baby. I don't. I can't. Don't, I can't don't. do it. Don't do it. No. Don't do, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't, don't do, do it, Joe. Joe, baby boy, Joe. <laughs> baby boy, right. listen to me. It's me, James, your grandfather. Uh, it's me, grandfather, James Weber. Papa? Yes. <laughs> yes, son. I'm so. an angel. <laughs> <laughs> don't what? buy a civic. Is this how you tell me you're dead, but also <laughs> deliver financial advice? <laughs> All right, yes. so that was the story of one. So that was the story of one Raymond Lowy and a Studebaker and sure Industrial. Lowy, not Louis. There's no R in it. Louis, Louis, maybe. I mean, I don't <laughs> it's know. French. Louis, 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 Louis. Now let's move on. Yeah, quick coal check-in. Is this the coal that you expected? This is pretty. This is pretty good coal. I'd say these are some. I'm learning pretty some good stuff. presents. Is this coal or not is it diamonds? Not a lot diamonds? of coal. This is not. This is diamonds. Yeah, and diamonds are forever. You can turn peanut butter into diamonds. What? There's no what? way. You can't turn peanut butter into diamonds. Well, you have to make That's it a carbon sure first, and then you have to squish it. Yeah, basically. I remember seeing a Nova special when I was like seven years old, and that was the intro of it. Right. Why didn't you write down how? <laughs> Our next story uh, comes from uh, a person named Chris. Hi, my name is Chris. I'm from the Edmonton area of Alberta, nice. Canada. Nice. My grandmother was from there. Oh, my nice. God, dude. Yeah. Small freaking continent. Go Do you make it Oilers. down to Regina often? Yeah, you ever been to Regina, Chris? <laughs> <laughs> I've been listening to you guys since the beginning and I love the podcast currently listening to the Lena Gade episode and hearing Nolan talk about being in the pit for an endurance race reminded me of a race a few buddies do in the winter up here in the Alberta Edmonton area in Alberta <laughs> <laughs> and I pit for him it's called the numb bum 24 hour <laughs> ice race oh wow it takes place on a frozen lake with dirt bikes and four-wheelers. They stud the tires and go racing. The track is usually about 15 kilometers. He uh, politely included uh, the Queen's distance for us. Not It's nine miles. <laughs> it's got hairpin turns, snails, straightaways. You name it, we got it as long as it's a turn. They do a Le Mans style start, which uh, means that you run to your vehicle mm -hmm. before you go. And the most laps wins. Being that it's in the middle of winter and we're in Canada, it can get, quote, cold as shit. Yeah. We've raced in, temperature, we've raced in temperatures anywhere between a few degrees above freezing to as low as 30 below zero. Some teams bring their RVs, enclosed trailers, even canvas tents with wood stoves oh. for warmth. And to be able to sleep or work on the bikes out of the elements. It is quite the spectacle. I imagine so. That sounds like it sucks. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I was like really hoping that he wasn't going to invite us to it. Yeah, and thank you, Chris, for uh, thank you <laughs> understanding our personalities enough to be like, these guys do not want to do this shit. Yeah, they, are, they live in Los Angeles. They live in Los they Angeles. They are soft. They are soft, yeah. soft, wealthy men. <laughs> They have cold noses when it's 52 degrees. <laughs> it is uh, 70, it is 63 degrees in this room and I am freezing. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, Chris did an awesome job not only piquing our interest uh, about this race, but giving us some solid info and linking us to an article about the race. So thank you, Chris. Uh, Our producers salute you for doing part of their job. Uh, (laughs) It will be reflected in their next paycheck. (laughs) The Num Bum has been described by everyone, even its race organizer, Dan Sharon, as something you have to be a little crazy (laughs) to compete in. You don't have to be crazy to race in this, but it helps. (laughs) (laughs) Even though that was me committing suicide, even though ice racing, usually on a motorcycle or quad is a common sport across many snowy states and provinces in North America. Not many ice racers are too keen to compete in the middle of February for 24 straight hours. Uh, In fact, the event was canceled in 2019 due to lack of directors and volunteers available, local politics and the need for new equipment, but reemerged. Thanks to organizer Sharon and his local racing club, Pembina Dirt Riders Association. Shouts out, Pembina. Shout out, PDRA. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> For the 2020 race, old pros and some riders who had never even raced on snow showed up to pay the $250 fee to enter, and a total of 20 teams and 75 riders raced that year, with many coming from miles away. There are several classes of racers competing simultaneously. A professional motorcycle class, amateur motorcycle class, a quad class, and a red-eye class for those who don't want to race in the dark. Hmm. Aren't those, isn't red-eye the people that want to stay up all night? I only race in the dark. Yeah. Oh, you! I was born racing in the dark. (laughs) You are the only adapted (laughs) for (laughs) it. I would probably, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't race in the dark. No, I wouldn't do that. I would race in the dark. I would. You would? I'm never doing this. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like being cold. I don't like being cold. I don't like being cold. What am I supposed to do? What's Uh, the deal with cold? What's the deal with cold? It's not hot. (laughs) It's it's not warm. What is it? (laughs) The winner is whoever completes the most laps in 24 hours, and they receive a trophy and street cred. Mm. Uh, Chris, maybe you mean lake cred. (laughs) 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 It's a true test of endurance, a feat of strength to see who can last the longest in brutally cold and temperamental Alberta winter weather. The racetrack is never the same, and it takes a group of dedicated people almost a week to fully plow and map the course. That's crazy, man. You got to be loony to race this one. (laughs) Hey, we call our money the loony, too. (laughs) (laughs) And then things get even harder. All right. Over the course of the 24-hour race, both changing weather conditions and general wear of the ice forces the course to actually have to be changed. This poses yet another challenge for riders. They have to relearn the course in the middle of the race. They have to learn a new track. That would be very difficult. We have some experience with tracks that are easy and hard to learn. Yes, we do. Willow Springs. Willow Springs. Very hard to learn. Yep. No landmarks. Yep. It's like being on Mars. Sometimes I'm like, I don't know where I am. Mm-hmm. Sonoma Raceway. Lots of landmarks. Yeah, way It's easier. like playing Mario Kart. Yeah. <laughs> I, could, I could draw Sonoma right now. Yeah. Yeah. I mean... I do have the fastest lap record ever. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Seven seconds. <laughs> Unreal. In 2017, for example, there was a blizzard that dropped 10 inches of snow overnight and is considered among racers as the toughest, nastiest numbum ever contested. And if that's not difficult enough, because it's a 24 hour race, over half of the numbum is run in the dark. With nightfall comes lower temperatures and re- obviously reduced visibility. Not to mention that repairing anything in the dark is more difficult. And considering that the team with the most laps wins, losing time due to malfunctions caused by weather or the cold uh, or otherwise can be a death knell. Ding. Every num bum race begins the same. Competitors are told to turn to a stranger <laughs> and introduce themselves. Oh, that's okay, awesome. That's, that's the nice. most Canadian that's thing cool. I've ever heard. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh, hey. And then they exchange uh, 
Donut. What are the <laughs> Tim Horton holes? <laughs> yeah, Bieber holes. <laughs> <laughs> hey, did you see the new uh, Will Arnett picture, eh? Yeah, I love the Will Arnett. <laughs> Fundamentally, the event is about building community, and even though this is a competition back at base camp, you never know who will be willing to pour you a hot cup of coffee or hot chocolate or hot tea. Or, or hand you a satchel of Timbits. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and and everyone's quick to lend you a much needed tool or some advice or help. And I think it, I find that that <laughs> some I find advice? that to be <laughs> like marriage advice, <laughs> yeah, financial. I don't know, yeah. but I find that to be the case at uh, a lot of racetracks. Yeah. We blew up our transmission at uh, Sonoma Raceway, and uh, we were able to find a transmission and get some people to help us put it back in, toot sweet, and get right back on track within yeah. a few hours. Yeah, so, that's cool. race people are cool. When the race starts, an official drops the green flag, and the first rider on each team runs 20 yards to their motorcycle or quad, starts the engine, and takes off. As we know from other 24-hour races, a good start is crucial, but each team has plenty of time to catch up. Typically, teams switch riders every hour or two, allowing their people to warm up or even take a nap, which apparently Nolan refused to do when he was uh, crewing for the 24 hour race. I just couldn't fall asleep. Yeah. As Chris mentioned in his email, racers use special tires with inch and a half spikes that give them traction on the ice. However, these spikes are dangerous. And due to a deadly accident in 2015, when a racer caught one of his legs in the rear <sighs> tire, a rule was added requiring wheel guards over the tires. Uh, there are also a fleet of snow plows on hand keep the course safe during the race or as safe as possible, I guess. And they run constantly to make sure that um, they're not missing anything. If you're interested in running <laughs> in the 2023 race, um, how could you not be? <laughs> <laughs> you can find out more information at uh, numbum.com. That's N-U-M-B-B-U-M dot C-A. Thank you, Joe, because it's Canadian. Yeah. Wow. Um, uh, you will not find us at this event next year. We will year. never go here. You will never see us here. There is no that chance that we miserable. will be here ever. That sounds so <laughs> miserable. Okay. Well, thank you for Maybe, uh, oh, your email, but, Chris. But it does bring up, you know, if there is uh, an endurance race or, you know, ideally a race that lasts maybe an hour or two. <laughs> <laughs> it's somewhere like Hawaii yeah. or uh, Fiji sure, or yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, the Florida Keys even. <laughs> Give us a give us an email. <laughs> we'd we'd love to show up there. Yeah, invite us to the Maui uh, two soft hours. But yeah, <laughs> yeah the, the, the Maui soft butt too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you for your email, Chris. This next one is from Josh. Quote: How about doing an episode regarding cars and the food industries, such as the revolution of the drive-through delivery services, such as the Pizza Guy, thirty minutes or less. DoorDash, Uber, Postmates, people got find over. Grubhub. You don't have to get an endorsement from anyone, but it'd be interesting. Also, try an experiment on the podcast. Order delivery, mm. purchase at the beginning of the recording, then wait for a real person to deliver it and include them on the podcast. That's kind of a fun I would love device. to get a That's pizza during a the fun, show. It's kind of a fun, Yeah, I'd love pizza during the show. That'd be sick. Yeah. You know what, Gavin, Christina, <laughs> why the hell isn't there any pizza here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, Josh, we can tell you a little bit about the history of the drive-thru. The revolutionary invention begins with the drive-in. The earliest drive-in on record was the pig stand, located on the Dallas-Fort Worth Highway way back in 1921. This was a location where Americans could drive up, park, and eat their dinner behind the wheel. Another early adopter of the drive-in was Carpenter's Sandwiches, a sandwich shop that offered American comfort food to the comfort of Americans' car. A&W, a restaurant known for hot dogs and root beer, opened their first drive-in in the 1920s in Sacramento and even have some retro drive-ins running today across the country. Dude, A&W, sleeper. Sleeper. Dude, oh, I used to hang out in that. an A&W parking lot all the time in high school. Yeah. Really? Yeah, it's, it was one of our meetups. Nice. That was the first place I ever had cheese curds, Joe. Oh! Really? In, Cal in a Tascadero. And Whoa. dare I say... Pretty good. Were they squeakers? They actually were squeakers. Wow. Wow. Hot squeakers yeah. in California. You don't find those very often. You don't rarely sleep on find hot squeakers in California. Yeah, don't Dude, sleep on A&W, man. I love sucking on a chili dog from A&W. <laughs> yeah. 
Deacon Jane. <laughs> in the late 1940s, after Let's the check second, <laughs> after the Second World War, car ownership began to climb up again, and so many different kinds of businesses developed drive-through services, such as drive-through banks with the little <laughs> tube. <laughs> 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 Groceries, even liquor stores. We had a drive through liquor store in Atascadero for yeah. the longest time. We had a drive through liquor store, uh, like, downtown in Louisville. Yeah. That would, like, just serve, at, like, children. <laughs> and so I would go there as a driving child. Uh-huh. And, and, like, <laughs> like, not only would they, like, have bottles of things, they yeah. would make slushies. Whoa. So Whoa. You get, like, an alcoholic slushy <laughs> in go. your car. <laughs> That's crazy. I was going to make a joke about did they offer to, like, open your bottle for you, but that, it's you have you to drink buy, it. You could buy a mixed drink. That's nuts. And they That's would hand insane, it to your car dude. window. That's to insane. You. Yeah. I mean, luckily, I've grown up with chauffeurs my entire life. <laughs> that I was doing this in the back of a Rolls Royce limousine. Yeah. Because yeah. the whole blank check thing. Yeah. Because yeah, the blank check. <laughs> In 1947, that was a really lucky turn of events yeah. when I found that blank check and I made yeah. it out for a million dollars, and I invested it really wisely, and yeah. now. Here we are. Here we are. I'm Batman. In 1947, <laughs> Red's Giant Hamburg, a down-home joint along Route 66 in Springfield, Missouri, opened and is widely considered America's first drive through restaurant. Originally, owner Sheldon Red Cheney operated the place oh. as a gas station, but realized the market in running it as a drive through restaurant. Were hamburgers, used, did they used to be called Hamburgs? I don't know. Red's was transformed into a giant Hamburg. Named because the last er wouldn't fit on the sign, <laughs> nice. and offered a simple concept: a drive-up window rather than a car hop service. That's how Pizza Hut got its start. They only had, uh, you know, what <laughs> eight spots for eight letters on their sign. Really? Yeah. Oh. The concept was a hit, and Red stayed open until 1984. Pizza Dog. <laughs> <laughs> However. Reds is an American classic, and the guy who bought the brand rights, David Campbell, opened a new Reds in ni- in 2019. It's such a classic guy. It must be like a Midwest thing, because I've never heard of that. I've Reds heard of it Giant Hamburg. The next drive through to open was In-N-Out, founded and run by the Snyder family in 1948 in Baldwin Park, California. This was Pretty a huge shock to, to me. I just found this out about a month ago. What, I was- In-N-Out's way better than Whataburger, and if you don't think that, then you're an idiot. No, it was that uh, in and out opened up before McDonald's. Yeah, it's pretty crazy, right? <laughs> this location offered even further innovation thanks to owner Harry Snyder, a two-way speaker box that allowed drivers to order dinner without ever leaving their car, the very invention that paved the way for the modern drive through It wasn't long before other small fast food chains opened and jumped on the drive through concept. Jack in the Box opened in San Diego in 1951 with a drive through concept built into the business from the jump. They also had a slightly unsettling take on the two-way speaker system. The brand mascot, Jack, a smiling clown, sat on top of the intercom box above a sign that read, Jack will speak to you. Uh, The guy who is in the Jack in the Box costume also writes and directs all of the Jack in the Box commercials. (laughs) (laughs) And I auditioned for a Jack in the Box commercial one time. And, like, normally, like... uh, You've been on commercial auditions. Yeah. Like normally it's like they're, they're going to see a million people and it's like in and out and like mm-hmm. not in and out the restaurant, but like it's just like very quick, like hold this bottle of Mountain Dew and yeah, yeah. say whatever. This guy sat me down at a table and like <laughs> explained the concept. That it was like when they were pushing like the like weed mm-hmm, box, mm-hmm. Like, yeah, this, yeah, yeah. like you can get it if you're stoned. We're not saying it, but like this is for being stoned at night. <laughs> and uh, and he sat me down and he explained the con like the joke of the commercial, and I was like, okay, <laughs> Jesus Christ, man! <laughs> and and he goes, he, he was like, so James, tell me, what would you like to be doing five years from now? <laughs> and like in my head, I'm just like, not this, yeah. like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> not auditioning for Jack in the Box commercials, dude. <laughs> But that doesn't mean I don't want this. Yeah, yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll gladly I need take this. It. I would love this. <laughs> Maybe he was looking for a successor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I fucked up. I could have been How that guy. against changing your name to my <laughs> name are you? How would you like to be <laughs> Mr. In the Box? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Wendy's, which was founded by Dave Thomas in 1969, was also a pioneer of the drive through concept. The brand still insists that they're the first to offer a modern-day pickup window. 
That's a, a loophole. Yeah. <laughs> they're, not, they're not claiming. Yeah, it's a first. modern day. How about let's like yeah. focus on the fact that their patties are square. That's like way more interesting than the the, the window. Anyway, while these <laughs> smaller fast food chains, were, you know what I mean? <laughs> they're square. Um, all these smaller fast food chains were all about the drive through. It took the bigger companies much longer to jump on board. Burger King and McDonald's didn't offer drive through windows until 1975. Nearly three decades wow. after Red's giant hamburger. One of the funniest videos on the internet is this training video from the 80s from Wendy's where they talk about all the hamburgers that you messed up. It's a wrap, first of all. Oh, yeah. It's a wrap. You should have led with that. Showing you how to turn all the messed up hamburgers into chili. Oh. But it's like a recipe and a training video and a wrap video Sick. all mixed in Dude, one. Those are like two of my favorite things. <laughs> All right, for our final submission, our producer Christina thought it would be nice to end on an answer to a submission question we get pretty often. This one comes from that car guy 127. Hey, so I am a huge fan of the podcast and the channel, especially High Low. I am a new content creator on YouTube and I'm trying to grow my channel. I do videos on the history of cars and the people involved in building them. And I'm wondering if you guys had any advice to give the channel name is that car guy one two seven. Okay, I think my f first piece of advice here, uh, honestly, would be to change the channel name. Yep, yep. Uh, that was the first thing I. Nothing thought. really jumps out at me for that car guy one twenty seven. I get where it's hard to come up with branding. Yeah, I'm not good at it. James is very good at it, but the the name I think has got to be the first yep. change we make here. The, yeah, there's a reason that you got to put one two seven at the end of it because you got to. There's a lot of that car yeah. guy. Uh, don't also, it's very close to that dude in blue who's already a very established mm -hmm. guy. Spend a lot of time figuring out uh, the first like 12 seconds of the video. Let everyone know what they're going to see and get them excited about it very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. And then deliver on so whatever that promise is yeah. uh, throughout the video. Uh, and I can't stress enough how important your thumbnail and the title of your video yeah. are. It's the most Go important. watch. Be on YouTube all the time. We are on YouTube all the time. I'm on it right now. I'm on it right now. <laughs> I'm not. Uh, look at the thumbnails and the titles of videos that are doing very yes. well. Try and uh, isolate the things that uh, you see like across the board in videos that are doing well. And honestly, just like apply them to your own stuff. Yes. And when you when you talk to people people from other channels, just be a cool dude. Don't try to push anything. Don't be weird. <laughs> people want to work with people that are normal and cool to work with. So yes, just be yourself. Yeah. On that note about unless you're weird, then <laughs> pretend to not be. <laughs> <laughs> I've been doing it for years. Um, yeah. So I hope that advice at least gets you on the right foot. Also consistency and uploads is very important. Best of luck to you. A lot of there's a lot of successful channels out there that started from various humble beginnings like yours, like MKBHD, uh, that dude in blue, Chris Fix, of course, like all uh, started, Mr. Beast, Mr. Beast, yeah, all started from very very humble beginnings, and uh, you can do it, you can do it too. Um, so I hope our advice helped you out a little bit there. That car guy one twenty seven. Hopefully your name is different soon. Yeah, hopefully. I went into like a James moment there. That was kind of weird. Anyway. So there we go. That was Santa's coal bag, uh, a, a grab bag of different ideas. It turned out to be Santa's present bag. Yeah, I would love to do that again. So keep emailing us your ideas at passgas at donutmedia.com. Fat, uh, Fat Nick and his deers brought us some real gold this <laughs> year, har, boys. Har. har, har, har. Big thank you to our producers, uh, as always, uh, Christina Felsky and Gavin Kinzel. And uh, you can follow the boys at Joe G. Weber. Follow James at James Humphrey. Follow me at Nolan J. Sykes. Follow the YouTube channel if you haven't already. Subscribe. Watch our videos. And follow Santa at Santa. <laughs> <laughs> All right. See you next week. Bye. Happy Honda days. <laughs> <laughs>